In this video, I'll explain some of the fundamentals of the NSX logical switch and how it can enhance traffic optimization compared to a vSphere distributed switch or a vSphere standard switch. So what is a logical switch? Well, we've had a vSphere distributed switch and a vSphere standard switch that are part of vSphere. This is a new type of virtual switch. And the logical switch is in the, is kind of the next step. Rephrase. And the logical switch is really the next step in the evolution from standard to distributed and now from distributed to our NSX logical switch. And what it's really going to do is add functionality on top of a distributed virtual switch. With NSX, we're still going to need the distributed virtual switch. We're not going to completely abandon that. Now, the logical switch is based on a kernel module. What it is is a distributed switch with this additional capability called VXLAN. It's based on the vSphere distributed switch. It's backed by a vSphere distributed switch, and it's going to use the physical adapters associated with a vSphere distributed switch. Our logical switches will not use VLANs. So prior to creating a logical switch, you'll establish a pool of what are called VXLAN network identifiers or VNIs. And our VNIs are going to start at 5,000. That way they're easy to distinguish from VLANs. And each VNI serves as a logical identifier for a logical switch. Now, one of the components that we're going to require for this VXLAN encapsulation is something called a VTEP. Right? A VTEP is a special VM kernel port specifically for VXLAN functions. Right? It provides VXLAN encapsulation and decapsulation. And we can create a logical switch that'll even span multiple distributed switches. And in a couple slides, we'll start taking a look at some diagrams. And a lot of this will probably become a lot more clear as we work through a few of the pictures. So really quickly, before we get to our pictures, let's talk about VXLAN a little bit. Now VXLAN is going to give you a tunneled transport across the physical network. And this provides certain benefits, the most significant of which is that you can create a layer two network that spans a layer three device. You can also provide logical segmentation using VNIs, similar to the way we create logical segmentation with VLANs. Okay, so let's take a look at a diagram and hopefully that'll make these concepts a lot more clear. So in this diagram, we see at the top of our screen, a distributed port group, right? And maybe that distributed port group is configured for some VLAN. And that VLAN has virtual machines on it with the address range of 192.168.1.0. So let's say that in this case, this is VLAN 10. And now I've got multiple virtual machines running on different ESXi hosts. Each one of those green blocks represents an ESXi host. So you got VM1, VM2, VM3, and VM4 that are all connected to the same distributed switch. And then on the bottom, we've got our actual physical network that's used to interconnect these ESXi hosts. So I have four ESXi hosts. Two of them are connected by a switch. And then there's a router in the middle and the other two hosts are connected by a different physical switch. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens when we issue an ARP request in this scenario. So like I mentioned, VM1, VM2, VM3, and VM4 are all connected to port groups on this vSphere distributed switch. And let's say that VM1 wants to ping VM4. Well, what will happen in that situation is VM1 will issue an ARP request if it doesn't know the MAC address of VM4. 
Okay, so if VM1 tries to ping this IP, 192.168.1.13, but it doesn't know the destination MAC address, it'll create a layer 2 broadcast called an ARP request. So here comes my ARP request from VM1, right? And it hits the physical switch, and the destination uh, MAC address is all Fs, right? That's my broadcast MAC address. And so what the physical switch is going to do is it's going to receive that broadcast, and it will flood it out all ports on that Ethernet switch, right? So here's my ARP request. We'll eventually hit Virtual Machine 2 but we're not looking for the MAC address of 192.168.1.11. So this virtual machine will essentially ignore that ARP request. And the physical switch will also flood the broadcast frame out its interface that's connected to our router here. And what does a router do with a layer two broadcast? Routers don't pass layer two broadcasts. So that's the end of my ARP request. And the ARP request never makes it to VM4. Therefore, VM1 is unable to discover the IP addresses of anything connected to this distributed switch on the other side of that router. And that's why a vSphere distributed switch requires layer two transport, right? A vSphere distributed switch can't do this. It can't span multiple hosts that are separated by a router. It doesn't work right. Now let's look at the same diagram, but let's replace the distributed port group with a logical switch. So again, VM1, VM2, VM3 and VM4 are all in the same network. 192.168.1.10, 11, 12, and 13. That's the network that these VMs are connected to. So we'll just notate that network here up on the logical switch and just add to the network. And let's say in this scenario, VM1 wants to ping VM4. But again, VM1 doesn't know the destination MAC, right? It knows the IP address it wants to hit, but it does not know the destination MAC address. So in order to discover that destination MAC address, VM1 is going to issue a broadcast, an ARP request. And that ARP request is going to hit this VTAP. And the VTAP now has the capability of saying, here's a layer two broadcast, right? This is a layer two broadcast that needs to be received by everything connected to this logical switch. So what the VTEP will do is it'll encapsulate that broadcast and it'll send a copy of it to the VTEP, which is just a VM kernel port that runs on each and every ESXi host that's part of this logical switch. And I know they're not pictured here, but this host will have a VM kernel port that's a VTAP, and this port, this host will have a VM kernel port that's acting as a VTAP. And our host on the far right has a VM kernel port that acts as a VTAP. So it's the job of the source VTAP over here on the far left. It's the job of this source VTAP to now receive that layer two broadcast, and it'll take it it'll wrap it up with a new set of outer headers, right? New source and destination IP, new source and destination IP, Mac, right? It'll create a new set of headers and put them on the front of that frame. The original frame and all of the original addressing still stays intact, right? The original frame is still there. The VTAP is simply putting an additional set of headers on the outside of the frame called our outer header. And the purpose of those headers is to essentially, this VTAP is going to ship a copy of that broadcast to this VTAP. And when it hits this VTAP, it'll hit these VMs and the, this VM does not match our ARP request. And here comes that layer two broadcast in the form 
of an IP unicast bound for this VTAP over here. So in this case, our router is going to see IP unicast traffic destined for 172.16.10.10. This is not a layer two broadcast as far as the router can tell. It'll pass that packet out the appropriate port on the router towards the physical switch and it'll arrive at the VTEP. And the VTEP will strip away those outer headers, exposing the original frame again with the original source and destination IP and MAC, right, which was our Ethernet broadcast frame. And that broadcast frame will arrive at VM4, and VM4 can then generate an ARP response. So that's how the logical switch is really very different than a distributed switch because a logical switch doesn't care about the underlying physical network. We can put as many routers in the middle as we want and we can still maintain one layer two segment across all of these ESXi hosts, even though they're separated by a router. So in review, our logical switches are mapped to VNIs instead of VLANs. They're going to use a VXLAN network identifier. Now, one thing I didn't mention is that the maximum transmission unit on our physical network is 1600 minimum. Let's back up to that last slide and let me explain why. Okay, so let's say again, Virtual Machine One generates an ARP request. When that ARP request arrives at the VTAP, one of the things that's going to happen is the original frame, let's call this the original frame with the original headers, is going to get encapsulated with a new set of headers. Right? That's the job of the VTAP, is essentially to say, here's a new destination IP address. Right? And the new destination IP address is the IP address of this VTAP over here. So it's going to append a new set of headers on the front of that frame, right? And maybe that frame had a frame size that was like 1524 or, or something like that, a pretty standard ethernet frame size. Well, when these additional headers are put on top of that, the size of the frame increases. And if the physical switch isn't properly configured to handle a frame that large, it'll have to break it up into multiple pieces and do what's called fragmentation and reassembly. Right. And if you're not really familiar with that concept, go back and watch the MTU video towards the beginning of this course. So that's why we have to have a higher MTU on the physical network because we're creating additional headers with VXLAN that are going to increase the size of a frame. And we don't want the frame to be larger than the MTU of the physical network. So the minimum required MTU on the physical network is going to be 1600. That's on the underlay network. Now, the NSX implementation of VXLAN uses UDP port 8472. That's different than the standard VXLAN port used by other vendors. And finally, we have this concept of transport zones. We're going to talk more about this in upcoming lessons, but I do just want to take a moment to introduce the concept of a transport zone at this point. The transport zone identifies the scope of the logical switch. We'll create transport zones that include multiple clusters of hosts. And when you create a logical switch, you actually create it on something called the transport zone. And the logical switch will span all of the hosts and clusters identified in that transport zone. So much more on that later on, but I just wanted to introduce that term at this point.